They say that there's safety in numbers, but there are definitely some exceptions, such as in stampedes, overloaded lifeboats, and the bystander effect. Allow me to explain. Buzz! If you're like me, you might be one of those people who goes over situations in their head beforehand in order to prepare. Of course, it rarely seems to go as planned. Um, hello? I'd like to order a large pepperoni? Do you have Supreme? Oh yes, actually. Oh, okay, good. Alright, what's the delivery address? 555 West Terrace. Oh, look at that! I'm already outside. Or maybe you're someone who fantasizes about being a hero, acting when no one else does to help a kitten cross the street or help an old lady get out of a tree. Hold on, I'm coming! Don't let go! Oh dear me. But it's hard to know exactly what a person, even yourself, will do when a situation arises. Instead, scientists describe likelihoods of reactions and try to predict what the average person might do. And when the predictions are for a whole group of people, we enter a subsection of social psychology sometimes called mob psychology not to be confused with mob psychology. So how have you been this week? Well, I spent most of it upside down in a dirty bucket, so as you can imagine, I have been busy questioning all of my life's decisions. Predictions of behavior are useful for designing things like stadiums and nightclubs. Architects calculate where exits and supporting structures should be based upon what might happen when a panic arises. Objects like doorways, pillars, and trees can be placed to either break up stampedes or encourage traffic flow. Mob psychology is also useful for designing emergency procedures, such as those found on airplanes, in government buildings, and for particularly wobbly chairs. Hmm. In case of emergency, sit harder. The bystander effect is a prediction of how a group of people will react when in a social situation that requires them to choose whether or not to help resolve a problem. Basically, it attempts to help us understand who helps whom and under what circumstances. The main prediction of this effect is that the more people who are present when an emergency occurs, the less likely any one of them is to help out. This is called the diffusion of responsibility. Let's say a pizza delivery guy arrives. If it's just you alone at home, you know that it's your responsibility to get up, open the door, and pay. But if there's a group of you, say you and four friends, it will probably take you longer to decide who's answering the door and who's paying. This diffusion of responsibility becomes dangerous in emergency situations. If someone starts choking on their food and you're the only other person there, you know you need to help them and take the responsibility of calling for help or performing the Heimlich. But if there are other people around, you might expect, or even hope, that one of them will intervene first. Unfortunately, this could mean that the choking person does not get help as fast. Now, how much this effect matters depends on circumstances, so exact predictions of behavior are difficult. In order to better understand what factors are at play here, social psychologists use real-life examples as case studies and design experiments. The first thing that comes to mind with the bystander effect is usually the 1964 case of Kitty Genovese, a woman who was stabbed to death by an assailant. Traditionally, it is said that Kitty's murder occurred outside of her apartment complex in front of 38 witnesses, none of which who did anything while her assailant stabbed her, ran away, and came back later to finish the job. At least, this is the textbook example that is frequently given. However, while this case might be useful for describing the bystander effect, it is not so useful for predicting human behavior. Why? Primarily because it is a case study, and case studies can never be as rigorous as properly designed experiments. And secondly, because many people get the details of the case wrong. As detailed in the 2007 investigative report of the Kitty Genovese case, linked below, only a few people saw the fight, nobody for sure saw stabbing, the police were called, and the second half of the fight took place in a secluded stairwell. But nowadays, we have much more reliable studies that examine situational factors. It turns out that a big factor is the ambiguity of the situation. If you aren't sure if someone needs help, or if they seem like they know what they're doing, you are much less likely to intervene. For example, if a guy is wearing one of those orange reflective safety vests, we usually assume he knows what he's doing and let him go about his business without interfering. Ah! Should... Ah, should we help ah, him? Nah, ah, I'm sure he knows what he's why? doing. So, how can you avoid the bystander effect? First, be less afraid to intervene in ambiguous situations. If you're not sure if that old lady needs help getting out of the tree, play it safe and offer anyway. Sure, you might make a fool of yourself, but that's a small price to pay to maybe be someone's hero. Secondly, if you're ever in an emergency situation with a group of people, studies seem to indicate that assigning jobs is a great strategy. Point at a guy and say, you, call the police. Then point at another guy and say, you, get the first aid kit, and people will take action much faster. If you're interested in seeing the bystander effect in action, 
There's a video link in the description below that'll take you to an old study called The Smoke-Filled Room. I highly recommend giving it a watch. So there you have it. I hope you've learned that a bystander is never as innocent as he claims to be. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel so that I can keep making stuff. And don't be afraid to leave a comment or hit the like button. If you want to watch another episode, click the screen indiscriminately. And I'll see you next time.